Hi, everybody. This is our final chapter in the book, Principles Guide to School Budgeting. This is kind of going to tie everything together that we've looked at throughout the course and hopefully it gives you some good, strong insights on kind of the last little bit of stuff that we're going to be looking at. Um, this really looks at site-based budgeting, which you have to consider because it's what principals you know, are going to do in their positions. We're going to talk about this again in Money in Schools, but this brings everything together in terms of finalizing the budget. So, um, what is site-based decision-making and why should we care about it? Um, many have deemed this as the future of schools. Um, it's going to make a difference if you're working in an environment um, where it's a big deal. It's a 21st century skill, and because of competition with private and charter schools, you definitely could see this notion of site-based decision-making grow more. Um, organizational theorists tell us that decisions have a direct impact on organizations and that's why we need to be worried about site-based management and why it's important. So this happened and it occurred out of the total quality movement, uh, total, total quality management movement in education. If this appeals to you, you should look up the book Charting Your Course uh, from Conyers and Ayers. It was the Baldrige Criteria book. Um, but that was really this notion that we should be going to site-based decision-making. Um, schools operate as separate entities, and that makes them more holistic to benefit the school district, and management should understand that because each building has its own unique identity. So we've spoke a lot about organizational culture in this class. You have to understand that each building has its own climate, organizational uniqueness, personality of teachers and staff, and that relates to the mission and vision of the district, and site-based decision-making must reflect that and have elements of the culture while having a unique culture itself. So why does this matter? Why do we care about this? Um, we care about this because it helps you build an effective budget and it considers all, all aspects of it in a public forum. It makes it more transparent because you're doing it and then you're sharing it with other stakeholders, which as I've said throughout this entire course, we've heard transparency, transparency, transparency. This is why this matters and this, why, this is why this is important. So our textbook says if you do site-based decision making, you put each individual student first. I agree. The challenges with this are then you're looking at costs for each individual student, which could even be worse. So you're benefiting the population you serve, but that creates a challenge as well. So my research has shown me that principals have trajectories in their careers. So if you build site-based management, you might not be there to see your building in the culture situation. If it works, you'll stay longer, you'll have autonomy, and that'll increase the overall organizational effectiveness as well. So, the textbook notes that all stakeholders should have a say. Our other book believes in this concept of an approved committee with rotating members. There isn't a right answer for this because it's a new concept. It really depends on the stakeholders in your community, the level of experience your personnel. Do you have an assistant principal? Do you have an administrative assistant who's been there a long time? Do you have a guidance counselor? Have you been there a while? So the personnel available really dictate how you build a site-based budget. So the school leader is the most important person. The best part about this model is they are no longer trapped in the middle. Because if they're making the decisions and they're the ones that are running the site-based decision-making team, they don't have to listen to what the lower level people say. They don't have to listen to what the central administration say. They make the decisions working in conjunction with what their staff is, and the decisions are more beneficial to everybody involved. So this text looks at it differently than money in schools. And it's why I want you to look at both chapters and compare it. Um, athletic directors, assistant principals, activity directors, and special ed directors um, are probably going to be more happy to be in a site-based model because then they get autonomy over what happens in the building. So this text really says we need to look at the different roles that others have. Money in school says you appoint people. The concept's so new, it really differs on what each approach is going to say. So how do you make decisions? 
You do it by saying my way or the highway. You pick the people who understand best or everybody works together. In the site-based management model, everybody works together through collaboration. That's what works and that's the goal of the system. So what should the building leader do? The building leader should look at what happened the previous year and the current year. They should look at teacher and staff input and find individuals at the school level budget committee to see if they can, if they can give input. It's imperative, too, that they're diverse in their assignments. Um, and you don't have just all people from one department or one part of the school. You have multiple people, multiple stakeholders, and that helps. And you make recommendations based off of that. So, um, you know, this is, it's different in this textbook than money in schools are. So I want you to look at this from the principal's guide to school budgeting perspective, not the money in schools one. When I lecture on that chapter, you're going to see something completely different. It's a different approach, and uh, it'll be looked at a little bit differently as well. So principal's guide says the band, choir, orchestra, and drama directors and the athletic director should always be involved in the budget process. These are the biggest extracurricular expenditures, um, and parents are kept happy when, they're, when these programs are strong in schools. So your school site directors, you should involve them in this if your system is switching to this. Teachers and grade level or department chairs should be involved. I believe one representative from each grade level should be present in an elementary school or a middle school environment, and at the high school it should be departmentalized. Um, if the department chair wants it to be their responsibility, they can be involved in the procedure as well. You should have one person from central administration. They need to be available to help you if there's something specifically related to budgeting, especially if you're a new principal. They have to give you the autonomy, but they have to give you the guidance to make this model work. Our book says students should be on the budget team if they're in grade six or above. I don't know about this, but I would argue that they might offer a perspective that you might not have recognized as important. They might say, classroom conditions are bad, my chairs aren't comfortable, my desk isn't what I want it to be, I feel like the windows are keeping the building cold. They might offer something that you might not know. And they're going to be more honest about it than your teachers are, because your teachers are there and they exist to keep you happy. So community members are good, but you have to make sure they're not power hungry. When a community member gets involved in schools, most people will say they have an agenda. So you need to find somebody who's not power hungry that doesn't have an agenda and that they can actually reflect on that population as well. So the next section goes over um, the steps to help you do site-based decision making. Pay attention to these. I will have these on the final exam. They'll definitely be on the quiz as well. So the first thing that you need in, if you're doing this procedure is you have to do a descriptive narrative. You have to say the years of operation of the building, where it's located, percentage of free and reduced lunch students, SPED, ELL, and other demographic information. This is like the project that we did at the beginning of the class where you were looking at the demographics. Then the mission statement. Remember what we have said multiple times about mission statements. Even though it's the school's goal or philosophy, it should relate to the overarching goal of the district as well. And then you have to make sure the mission statement impacts how the school will be funded. Student enrollment, if you want an example of this, please see pages 178 to 181 of the textbook. What I try to tell you to do is do your strategic planning. What is the school going to look like 3, 5, 10, 30 years from now? People are going to move in the district, and you could have a newborn and toddler population as well that you have to consider. So then you have to look at the academic improvement plans. Are there any sources of data that tell you that academics need to be improved? Does an instructional program need to be improved? Is the instructional program going to last long term? Do you need research to support something that you're trying to do in your building? That should come after you've looked at the demographics because the demographics are going to support your instruction. Then you do a needs assessment. What do you need? How can you improve your building based off of what the data has shown you? This should be collaborative, and if you have research that backs it, that helps and it supports it. Priorities. Instruction should be your first priority, but the most expensive part of your budget is obviously personnel. 
Personnel directly correlates with the quality of instruction. So take the most important things, list them and rank them in descending order, and make sure that other stakeholders give you their list and their rank as well. The teacher-student distribution table, um, I like this. It's in our textbook on page 163. You're welcome to visit it. Um, but know that this is different from state to state. Um, so you're going to be thinking about things that are more important for your context. But what I think matters is you look at the previous year and project how many students will be in each grade based on the previous year. Then you might have to hire somebody to be a moving teacher because there might be larger populations in some grades than others. Then page 164 talks about faculty appointment. So this is basically the people that work in the school. It could be shared between buildings. So you might have a phys ed teacher that goes to three different buildings. You might have a guidance counselor that goes to two different buildings, a librarian who's only there half a day on Fridays, Mondays and Wednesdays, and then spends their other day in another building, Tuesday, Thursday, and then the other half on a Friday. You have to figure out where that faculty goes and what budget that's coming out of. If you need additional personnel, you need a narrative to explain why it is critical to hire somebody additional. So if you feel like you need it, you should be able to justify it as well. So in our textbook on page 165 is the allocation statement. Um, this, takes, this takes a look at the funding and attendance and how you use that to allocate money. Remember, in our state, we go on based on attendance, but there are also a weighted attendance model. So that's important to note. And different populations have different weights and receive different funding. So salaries, um, that's in our textbook on page 165 and 166. And if you can figure out the distribution of salaries, you can see where cutting employees or cutting costs or not replacing a particular individual might improve your school as well. So I'm not going to have you design a salary distribution ta table because in your positions, you probably don't know what everybody makes. And that's probably going to be offensive if you ask somebody, hey, what you make? I'm doing it for a project in class. But keep it in mind when you're a principal, because then you're going to know what they make what the professional staff do, um, what the salaries that the, the salaries that they're due in terms of raises, what types of raises. This is important when you're planning a budget. So once you have the budget put together, you use the district mandated software, or you can put it in Excel, prepare it, have your team review it, and then submit it to the school district, preferably the superintendent, then the school board. And that's the best way to look at the budget. So there are different types of revenue that come in for budget allocations. We have general revenue, special revenue, capital projects, and debt services. Debt services really look at the bonds. Capital projects are your building major expenditures. Your special revenue are different programs. If you're increasing vocational ed, if you have a high population of VOL, that's what that comes from. And your general revenue, that's your basic things for the operation of the school. So I keep saying this over and over again. Um, you know, student enrollment is everything. I'm going to give you the suggestions, and we can take a look at them because that's important. So you need to look at um, if there are new homes being built, if there are rental properties in their emergency in their emerging communities. If population patterns are changing, that's significant because if people are going to your community to retire, they're obviously not sending kids to school but there's still going to be tax dollars coming in. If people are leaving the public school to go to a charter or a parochial school, that can impact your tax dollars as well. If there's an open school enrollment policy, meaning they can go to neighboring districts, that can impact the money you get. If there are vouchers, vouchers can be a massive issue if you're trying to plan and budget for how many students you're going to have. Um, if a major business goes out, if a major business goes out of business and it was the business that was the lifeblood of the, of the district, that can hurt you as well. And if your district has a high mobility rate, that's a problem too. So there's a budget calendar um, on page 185. It's a good example. Um, this is district and building specific. Um, and it should give you some guidelines to look at when you're looking at budgeting. But you, know, you have to make sure that you do this on your own. And it can be done through the entire school year. But it's based on your district. So once you have a budget, you have to defend it. If you've documented everything, you can take it to the district level, people will support it, and it will work. And that will give you the foundation that you need. 
So the rest of the textbook, the end of the textbook is 50 pages for forms and budgeting. If you end up at a charter or private school, I would look at these forms. I would take them. I would see if you could take them and improve on them in your organizations. But if you're at the district level, all these forms probably already exist. And because of that, you might take something that you might see that's different and unique, and you can add it and improve on it. So that's it. That's the end of this text. My advice to you is to use this to put everything together and use this text basically as a guide moving forward. Hold on to it and keep it because it can help you. Thank you.